हेलो 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 एवरीबॉडी सो वी लाइक टू स्टार्ट सो एवरीबॉडी प्लीज ग्रैब देयर सीट्स um first take your coffee and your muffin and everything else it's all in the back please help yourself um there's plenty of food around but now welcome to the sunday matinee um we are doing um in connection to the exhibition the origins of uh, innocence by bernie lobel and um i'm very happy that we have uh, bernie here right with us um and uh, we have another very special guest with us today and that is Martha Brown who came from Tor Toronto from Ryerson University there uh to join us um and have a talk with us and uh, with Bernie uh over here so um i just like to quickly give some practical info on um the talk just now and um then we just start straight away um so um we have um three parts or actually four parts in this talk and that is that um bernie will start giving us an uh, presentation about his work um maybe some of you have been to the exhibition that has opened last friday and uh, so you have had the chance to try out uh the exhibits and uh have a look around already uh if not you will have the chance after the the uh, talk again so um bernie will talk about his work a little bit and uh, uh you might have seen that uh, a lot of his work is um um has a reference to etienne Et Et schumacher um and um uh he's also going to um go into that direction what the connections of his work are uh, in that regard but um then we also have uh, an expert on mare with us and that is marta who has uh, uh, published um, um uh, a book about the work of mare that helped or actually was was um, triggering some fundamental um reconsideration and reevaluation of his work and um so um we hear a little bit of that i think and um after that bernie and marta um will have a conversation um about mari about bernie's work and about many other things and this is the point where you're also invited to come in with any uh, comments or questions you might have um so first we do the two presentations and then i would just check how the um how the atmosphere is in the, in in the space if you have any direct questions if not we start the the conversation and then you are you're very welcome to jump in at any time with questions you might have as this is a little bit of a casual setting we've been trying to set up this afternoon um we um want to keep it that way and you can always you know um if you have to it quietly you can always grab another coffee in the back and help yourself with with other things so for now i'd like to start one more addition and that is after the talk uh we also would like to just sort of diffuse this setting and take a tour around the exhibition so the things that we've been talking about um can be also you know discussed in a applied matter uh manner sorry um uh at the exhi exhibits around the space so now i hand straight over to bernie right. well, please well, thank you thomas and uh i you know i uh, wanted to thank um thank v2 for um having me here and having me um do this show it's uh, it's been it's been great and uh, also of course uh, the people at uh, fact in liverpool who uh, created uh, this um you know or started this tour in conjunction with v2 so um uh and also came up with the idea initially of bringing uh, marta and myself together to have a conversation about this which um 
which is which is really really um, going to be great, I hope. <laughs> um, you know, Thomas was saying, he was saying, first we do this, and then, uh, but first we do this. And I was thinking my, uh, my daughter uh, was a softball player when she was in uh, high school. And, and her coach would uh, always, because they, they, they were, there was some talent on the team, but they were made lots of errors. They would always be dropping balls and, and the coach um, and not making the throws and, and missing and, uh, and swinging at the wrong time. And the coach sat them all down at one point and I happened to be there and he said, um, first you make the catch, then you make the throw. You know, so first we make the catch here. Let's see. Um, <laughs> I'm... Uh, so I thought I would talk about my, my work just briefly from the, from the perspective of touch. Because as you can see, I want people to touch and play with all my pieces. And, um, and it's essential to, to, to uh, the way I work. And this is an outline for a, uh, for a, long, a long talk I do about touch. Um, and I thought I would um, put this up here so you can kind of see a little bit about how things interconnect for me. I'm not going to do this this whole thing, of course, because um, this is going to be a short little version. Uh, um, but I, but I will start um, start with uh, the at the same place, and that's with the pleasure centers in the brain, because uh, when I was in 1963, when I was in uh, college, I was taking a psychology class, and the uh, and uh, and we we saw this article. We were all given this article to read about the pleasure centers in the brain, how a rat will you know, who has an electrode, as you can see, inserted in this particular spot in their brain, will uh, will push a lever, you know, indefinitely, to um, you know to get you know to get the stimulation at the pleasure center. They will ignore food. They will ignore you know um, other female rats that are in estrus. They will they will just they will just go for this pleasure. Um, and and this kid sitting next to me said. Um, you know, the whispers in my ear while the professor is explaining this, it says, you know, the pleasure centers are connected to your skin. Now, I don't know if that's true. Actually, Isabella here might know if this is true or not, but I thought, I didn't want to find out if it was true because I like this idea very much. I like the idea that, that touch was something that we might crave more than anything else. Uh, you know, um, but even if it isn't directly wired to our, our um, you know, our skin, you know, I think, uh, you know, touch is essentially pleasurable. I think it's, you know, because our bodies impose this essential isolation that the, uh, um, you know, that, that when, we get to, when we get to test that boundary, when we get to push against this, um, you know, uh, kind of like kissing, you know, you get this experience that's completely different. You know, there's an old song, uh, you get to, like get a little taste of the other at the same time as you're connecting with yourself at the same knowing yourself and knowing something about something outside of you at the same instant you know i don't know if you know this old song which i'm going to do a very bad version of um it's um you know is it in his walk oh no it's not the way Oops, i've already started in the wrong oh, key and, and you're not to listen to all i say but if you want to know if he loves you so it's in his kiss that's where it is so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so i think touch kind of defines you know uh, who we are it, it you know our skins are boundaries you know and um so it makes this sense of identity of our own identity possible when we touch something, you know, it's kind of a mirror, you know, uh, in a sense. And my artwork, as you can see, requires touch, and it requires um, participation and often teamwork for a full experience. You know, so if you touch the work and you feel it work, you kind of understand things in a different way. I think our bodies, our bodies have knowledge that our our minds and our eyes, you know, don't quite have any longer. They had we we. This was all we knew when we were children, but now we know things in a different way. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of giving this very brief thing. I'm going to kind of use touch as a touchstone for uh, for my for discussing my work. I don't know if you know the touchstone is this. 
I think it's, I don't know what, exactly what mineral it is, but it's a rock that if you strike gold across it, it will make a, a certain colored streak. But if you were to take a piece of brass that looked exactly like gold, it would make a green streak and you would know you wouldn't have gold. So the touchstone was the, is the, is sort of the, uh, the, uh, the emblem of truth, you know, with a touchstone you can tell truth from falsity, and with touch you can tell truth from falsity. Uh, and, um, you know, um, a, a lot of, um, I, I just like this image a lot, but uh, anyway, I, I especially like Joseph in the background because Joseph doesn't have a clue about what's going on in the world. <laughs> he is not in contact in any way. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but, and the, uh, I don't know, the baby Jesus is so creepy. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, a lot of, a lot of what I'm about to say comes from a book, uh, entitled Touch by, um, by, uh, a, a novelist, Gabriel Josi Pavici. Uh, it's a book of essays and, uh, um, oh, this image is not from Gabriel Josi Pavici, uh, but, uh, but I, I would throw this in anyway. So um, this, this is from Josie Povici. He, this is a still from the end of the movie City Lights by uh, Charlie Chaplin. And in the movie, Chaplin as the tramp, who his back is towards us here, is, um, you know, has, you know, has fallen in love with this, uh, at that point, a blind flower girl. And she, you know, thinks he's a rich man because uh, in the way he, stumbles onto her. He has walked through a rich man's car, so he enters her space, as it were, through this rich, this 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 um, implied richness, and he encourages her to think that he's quite wealthy, and he goes through all these shenanigans. The whole movie is about him trying to find money to help her with an operation to regain her sight and to pay her rent, and he winds up giving her thousands of dollars at the end, which he has come up come upon, you know, legally, but in a way that winds up getting him arrested. And when he gets out of jail, he, uh, he sees her in this flower shop. Now she has her sight restored. And she doesn't recognize him, of course. She thinks he's just this tramp. So she goes to give him, you know, 50 cents. <laughs> he's given her $5,000. She gives him 50 cents. But nevertheless, uh, you, know, um, you, know, at the, at, you know, she doesn't recognize him until the moment when she grabs his hand to put the money in it, which is the exact inverse gesture that he had taken to uh, to give her, you know, the five thousand dollars. He had taken her hand and placed the money in it, and um, you know, at that moment, you know, suddenly she says, uh, you know, he he says, so you can see now, and she says, oh yes, I can see now, you know, of course, implying that she can understand all the all of her own prejudices against tramps. She'd been waiting for this rich man to come back and all this stuff. Um, anyway, I get a I get a. I get a little, I always get a little chill out of this moment, you know, in this movie, and, um, you know, uh, and, and, and the question that Josie Pavici raises is, why do we get this, uh, the, uh, I'm hoping you have a little, little some reaction anyway, why do we get this feeling? And, um, and I think it's because, because we can understand, we don't know this experience exactly, but we all have bodies, and because we all have a body, we can, we can understand other people's experience. The very fact of uh, having a body allows us to empathize with someone else and to understand things and, 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 and to communicate. Um, so uh, anyway, some of this I've already said elsewhere. So I, I'm, this is a piece that's downstairs, which you may not have gotten to yet. Um, but generally, I'm not going to show you pieces in the show. But this is sort of a very, a very direct touching piece, where you're directly touching another person, except that there is a bit of latex protection between you and the other person, which is kind of appropriate. Um, uh, so I was going to show you this, um, uh, you know, a little bit about another piece that isn't here, you know, a piece that requires participation rather than witnessing. I, I like people to be involved, to be inside the work, rather than looking in from the outside, and uh, and to have. And, and as Josie Pavici, he, one of the things he points out, which I quite liked, is he said he says 
I mean, I'm actually extending it a bit. He says sight is free, and in a sense, it's promiscuous. That wasn't the word he used. But you know, I can look around the room. I can, my eyes will fall upon each of you for a, a second. But there's no commitment. You know, I can look out across. You know, I can't see too far, but I can look at fairly significant distances here. If I were in a room with a window, I could look out the window at the horizon. But if I were to touch anything that, that was even in this room, I have to make a commitment. I have to get up. I have to cross over to it. I have to, um, I have to actually have physical contact. I have to be re-engaged in a world of time and, um, uh, and um, if nothing else. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to show you a short, uh, oops, yeah. Where is it? Uh, oh, no, I had another little wrap here. Anyway, I've already said this. Here's a short video of the uh, installation that isn't here. Oh, we forgot audio, didn't we? Oh, ah. Well, let's crank it all the way up on my tiny little laptop. I'll turn it towards you. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about that. Um, anyway, this is a sheet of black plastic, which becomes, uh, ah, here we are. I forgot about it, but everyone is ready for me to be wrong. Uh, not quite. <laughs> not quite ready. I'll wait till you tell me, give me a signal. Anyway, you, you, you pedal the bike and you make this black plastic become an ocean. I've, this is a piece kind of about uh, being lost on the sea at night, you know. Uh, and I figure that, you know, if you're lost on the sea at night and you're making landfall, you're, uh, what you would be looking for is lights on the horizon. You can see at the horizon of the black plastic there are lights glowing. And, uh, and that's because of the rowing on the boat. I'm, I'm on? All right. Just in time for it to be over. And, uh, and but anyway, the rowing is very hard work. So you get tired, and the lights flicker, and they go out. So you, you, you never get home. You stay lost on the sea forever because um, because it increases sufficient latitude, and latitude is really only half of what you need to know where, about where you are, and it's the easier half at that. It's uh, when you're when you're out at sight, uh, out of sight at land on a uh, on a starless night, you're basically lost. And uh, and I figured this is a kind of thing. You know, this is sort of a theatrical participatory thing that I sometimes will do with my pieces to create this little scene, but. The story that I have in the video is not necessarily the story that you, you can create when you come and play with the pieces. So I like to have that kind of thing be open and uh, it's sort of like a theater set that you can walk onto and perform in, in a way. Um, so, um, uh, so the the installation that I wanted to, to talk mostly about here is, is and, and is right around us, is the ideology of innocence. And, um, uh, and uh, I, you know, I, uh, this piece was really inspired by the work of Etienne Jules Marais, and, uh, and inspired in large part by having read Marta's book, because without her book, I would not have known enough technical details from her, um, the amazing set of pictures that she's collected in this book, um, not to mention the text. I would not have known how to actually recreate th this, um, this, this work of Marais and then modify it and extend it into something that worked for me. But just, to, if, just as a quick brief intro to Marais, he's probably most famous for these images like this. Marta will talk more about this. I'm not really going to, to discuss this because uh, you know she has plenty of more of Marais stuff. But I wanted to get to this image because this was the f I was visiting in 1994. I was visiting the Bakken Museum in Minneapolis, and I saw this mechanism, the actual thing itself. And um, you know, and this is a, a, a pneumatic mechanism, unlike the photographic investigations that Marais in, engaged in later about motion, trying to understand motion. Earlier, he was working pneumatically, hooking people up to pneumatic sensors to try and understand motion. And um, in this case, he's trying to understand speech. So you put your lips over these two little hooks, and you would be speaking, and your, uh, your breath would go into this tube, and all of this would be registered pneumatically 
on these, uh, in, you know, in, on these inscriptors uh, that would be writing pneumatically. And this, you know, I, this technology just like inspired me, and you'll see it all over the place <laughs> in um, in the exhibit here. And um, and I was especially interested in this other image that I got in a pamphlet from uh, the uh, from the visit to Marais. This image. Um, you know, of, of heart simulation. You know, here he has trying to simulate how the heart might be working um, so that he could then, you know, investigate it. Uh, and this image, which comes from Marta's book, of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of, of a more complex heart simulation. I, um, so a year after I uh, was in uh, Minneapolis being amazed by this work, I um, was diagnosed with an aortic aneurysm and had to have heart surgery to save my life. And, um, and I'm thinking, oh, here's this image, here's Marais' work with this very prominent aorta. And uh, I think I've got to do, um, I've got to do something a la Marais vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, including this in my, in my, in my artwork in some way. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I felt I had to do something that would reflect the fragility. Uh, I'm going to skip over that, the fragility of my own life, and also kind of capture some of the fragility from that image. This is a little video, and it's good that we have the audio. This is a little video of my experiments, a la Marais, trying to figure out how to incorporate his work into the kind of things I was doing. So I'm making make this this piece of equipment to rotate this disc. And then I've got this, uh, you'll see in a moment, these Marais style, uh, Marais style, um, you know, writing apparatus, uh, these tambours writing directly on the wood. And what I was measuring at that moment was I was trying to measure uh, what I call people's attitude, you know, which is, but how how uh, how my friend is leaning? <laughs> I mean, perhaps philosophically, but at least how he's leaning, uh, uh, you know, physically on the stool, and he's pumping these pneumatic tambours. Now you will see this piece is right behind everyone here, having been transformed into a completely different kind of experience, which okay, you can have now. directly. We don't need to discuss it. Um, and uh, so these are kind of Marais style tambours, but in this case made with toothpicks and uh, wood instead of, uh, instead of these precision brass, uh, you know, uh, drums. I have a little copper though. <laughs> I know, it's a good touch, it kind of brings it back to the real world. And of course this big, this big wooden disc is, is wobbling a lot, it's so large, that I added this extra this extra component to, uh, to, to measure how much wobble there was in the disc. <laughs> because, because this was sort of, this was part of what appealed to me so much about Marais' uh, work, was that it, um, was that he, uh, you know, he was so intent on investigating everything that he would apply what he wanted, his technologies and any technology he could come across to in finding out. He really wanted to understand these things. So anyway, also I discovered, oh, you could do these wonderful remote actions, you know, using these pneumatic tambours. And here I've got a releasing these balls pneumatically. To no real purpose, <laughs> just because I could do it. <laughs> and then I added one more tambour for them to bounce off of. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then the, the, the secret, I think, to, for me to making art in general is to, is to have waste. I need to be generating lots of stuff. I'm not sure what I'm doing yet. So I'm making, now I'm making organs. And this is like an aorta that has been badly abused. Um, <laughs> And uh, that, that was cast over a, um, a, a hair dryer hose. This was cast over um, a, a yam, like a sweet potato. And, uh, and the first organ that you saw was a, a prickly pear, a chiote. This is an eggplant. I was eating my fruits and vegetables, <laughs> trying to stay healthy. <laughs> um, this was cast over a balloon. Not everything was exotic and health, healthful. 
Um, and this I actually made a little wax branching thing to, and, and then cast it in latex. Here's another chiote. My neighbor had a chiote vine growing in his backyard, which meant it was also growing in my backyard because there's no way to stop it. And uh, it, um, you know, so it, just at the moment um, when I needed it, the chiote appeared in my backyard. Um, this was a gourd that I found on the streets of Jersey City, and which is a very urban place. But there was a gourd, big green gourd on the streets that I cast, and the it has an aneurysm at the neck has it, it kind of exploded out. And this friend of mine, uh, you know, after my, my aneurysm, this friend of mine said to me, you know, Bernie, if only you hadn't picked that gourd up, you would never have had this problem, you know? <laughs> but I did. <laughs> so, um, and you'll actually see a few of these parts have not only made it into the ideology of innocence piece that we have around us here, but a few of these parts have made it into other um, other installations here. Although some of them are still are sitting in a jar over there, and some of them are just in a box at home and never made it into anything. So now I'm starting to try and recreate Marais engraving. You know, I've got the organs mounted on the board. Maybe we can boost the audio on this a little. I don't know. But I can't figure out how I'm going to activate them yet. I mean, you, you're, we're looking at the end results right in front of us here, but... So, I like intermixing these body parts and these fruits and vegetables. And this is more or less the way it is now, except that it's got a little so maybe maybe I'm trying to um, to you know to uh, to gain regain some kind of control over my body. This is why I'm working on uh, on um, on making a piece that comes out of my my coronary condition. But but this is the kind of control that I usually gravitate towards. Is something like this is an outline for um, for for another investigation. You know, I mean, this is, I feel like I'm in control when I'm doing this, so I don't know if it's so much control as some kind of, uh, some kind of recognition of how little control I have. And, um, and uh, anyway, uh, you know, I think at this point, maybe, um, you know, I'm, I'm 14, one minute and 14 seconds over, and uh, <laughs> I, it's I got this. Thing, it's going. It's still going. The more we talk about this, the longer I go. So maybe I'll I'll turn the talk over to Marta, okay. and uh, switch to uh, to um, to her uh, presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I think I've switched to you. Yeah, yeah you yeah, have. Yeah, I have yeah. a black okay, spot, and yeah. I love your. I want to tell you, I love your yam. My yam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Yammering is a way of, uh, about talking too much, you know. No, not at all. <laughs> but uh, Mare, besides being uh, the inspiration for the marvelous work that Bernie does uh, and that is all around you today, his decomposition of movement was astonishingly influential in a number of other disciplines. And I just want to give you a list so we know what we're talking about. So Mare first succeeded in mechanically graphing the movements within and of the body. Uh, he, <laughs> that's a good idea. There he is, as a young person. Um, he triggered a, a revolution in medicine by creating the means to translate all invisible life functions, like the beat of a heart, into a visible and legible form, which I'm going to show you. All the electric graphing machines that you see in hospitals today, like electrocardiographs, encephalographs, oscilloscopes, they all derived from graphing machines that Mare devised more than a century ago. And then using the same principles as he did with his graphing, graphic method, he honed the photographic camera into a scientific instrument to analyze the motion of humans and animals. Then Wilbur Wright, who you might know, suggested that without Mare's study of the flight of birds, he and Orville would have never taken to the air. Whoops, my microphone just went. Okay. Uh, it's, still on. it's still on. So 
that's aviation. And without uh, Mare, for anybody studying the birth of uh, motion pictures, his work is crucial. It's the source of both the uh, Edison and Lumiere brothers' later inventions. Mare was the first person to use motion pictures as training materials for athletes, but this is only one of a number of important contributions he made to the history of physical education and gymnastics. And finally, the European science of work was founded on his studies of the body at work and the working body. So, born in 1830, Mare trained to be a doctor but he found the new science of physiology more suited to his taste for pure research and to his talents. He was a mechanical genius. He believed that he could make physiology a more exact science, the equal of physics and chemistry, which were the most advanced sciences of his day, by using machines to measure the functions of the body to determine the laws that govern them. And at the root of this was a radical perception of the human body because Mari saw the body as a machine, an animate machine whose workings could be explained by the laws of theoretical mechanics. And more radically, he defined the life which animated this machine as a complex motor which, like inanimate motors, consumed fuel and supplied energy. A motor, in fact, whose functions could be reduced to the newly discovered laws of thermodynamics. And then, ultimately, Mare confined himself to one subject only, the, and that was the body's most manifest form of energy, movement, or as he put it, the language of life itself. But of course, when he started working, it was a language that no one had yet deciphered, and Mare had chosen to explore a domain in which the unaided senses were powerless. So his great achievement was to adapt graphing machines used in physics to record motion within and of the body without recourse to the hand or to the eye. He began by graphing the internal dynamics of the body and then the external kinetics. And at the end of his life, he studied the media through which these moving beings moved, the eddies and the ripples in air and water. And for Mare, the graphing instruments were the intermediaries between mind and matter, which we'll talk about. So let me be specific now. Can you go back to me? Yeah, yeah. And see, will this come on? Right. This is the first instrument Mare constructed. It's a sphygmograph, and one of the, it is one of the earliest pulse takers and inscribers. It inscribed this pulse with a stylus on a smoked, blackened box, which you can see there. But the sphygmograph, as you can also see, had to be attached to the wrist, and for the majority of the body's movements, such direct contact was not possible. By 1862, Mare had come up with a method of transmitting movement through the air. He stretched a rubber membrane tightly, uh, tightly over a tiny metal drum and connected it by hollow rubber tubing to another attached to a stylus, as Bernie showed us. So any impulse given to the first tambour, as these metal drums were called, was directly transmitted to the second and to the stylus marking the smoke blackened cylinder. And this method of transmission allowed him to transform the organic world into a mechanical form of writing, both intelligible and permanent. These machines graph circulation, but they also present us with something else that is critical to Mare's thinking. In order to verify the accuracy of what he was analyzing, Mare synthesized his analysis with other mechanical no models that he called his schema. Yeah. So, the here last is... The image, by the way, was a pantograph mechanism, which I've, I've uh, stolen, in a sense, <laughs> from Mare, who had stolen it from James Watt and numerous other people before. And but there's a pantograph, a pneumatic pantograph, uh, a la Mare, uh, over in the corner here. Anyway, a little interruption. Not at all. <laughs> so here is his polygraph, which measure, measured circulation and um, respiration, and his myograph, which measured the phases and the speed of muscular contraction. 
This myograph provided him with the first visible tracings of fatigue. You can see where the line starts to smooth out in the diagram on the right. And also the earliest understanding that fatigue was the limiting factor in the human motor's ability to produce work or to run efficiently. So it seemed imperative to him at this moment that he investigate the more complex acts of movement in order to elaborate the laws governing the conservation of bodily energy. And that's the reason that in the 1870s he turned from graphing the inner dynamics of the body to graphing the phenomena that produced locomotion. Here, the primary difficulty was, of course, maintaining contact with two, or in the case of the horse, four moving legs or birds, two wings. But he started with creating special shoes that contained a hollow chamber connected by rubber tubing to the receiving tambour and stylus. And with some variation, the technique also worked for horses. The resulting inscriptions gave the first accurate recording of the horse's paces, and that was the resolution of one of the deepest mysteries of the 19th century. Birds were a little more difficult, but Mare had some success in describing the elliptical path of the wing enough success to build a model airplane and a model insect and a bird which is very close to Bernie's belief would be my brother on our left. This of course marks the beginning of French aviation. But Mare knew that he needed a machine that would make an optical trace, a picture of the movement. A picture would provide a description of the movements of subjects that couldn't be harnessed to the tambours and rubber tubing, and a picture would give the exterior characteristics of the whole body in its changing dimensions as it moved, and all of the relationships that occur between one body, body part and the other simultaneously. And in 1878, just as he was facing this problem, such a pictorial solution was offered in this sequence of photographs of trotting and galloping horses published in La Nature, the French scientific journal. They were taken by Edward Mybridge, an American Anglo-American photographer who was hired by the governor of California, Leland Stanford, to photograph his horses because Stanford had apparently seen Mare's tracings showing how the horse was suspended in the air at a certain point. And Stanford wanted that proven by a photograph, that is, uh, something made by a machine that did not lie. So, inspired by Mybridge, Mare took up photography. After experimenting in 1882 with a photographic gun that made 12 sequential images on a rotating disc, uh, Mare succeeded in decomposing faces of movement on a single fixed plate with a single camera and in real time. And I'm just going to show you how he did that. He dressed a man, and he all only worked on men. That was a default body, no women. Um, all in white, and he had that person, that man, move in bright sunlight in front of a black background. He operated on this body with an ordinary camera with its lens left open, and behind the lens he put a rotating metal disc, as you can see here, which had from one to ten slots cut into it at even intervals. Now, as the man moved in front of the black background, he would be in a different location each time a slot in the rotating shutter exposed the glass plate, creating a sequence of images. And the faster the disc shutter rotated, the more images would layer on the same plate since less time would elapse between the exposures and the subject, of course, would cover less ground. But Mari's camera was obscuring what he actually wanted to see, which was the clear expression of movement. So operating on the subject this time rather than the camera, he eliminated the superimposition, first by covering the half of the body in black velvet, as you can see here, and then by covering the whole body in black and marking its joints in white. So now he had pure movement detached from the performer and conveyed in a graphic form and, of course, a photographic image totally without 
precedent, and he called his method chronophotography. And chronophotography allowed Mare to finally analyze the mechanics of how we actually walk, run, and jump, and how the animals with whom we share this planet actually move. In the 1890s, chronophotography also enabled him to study the movement of the inorganic, the trajectory of projectiles, the geometric forms, engendered by a string or a wire moving around an axis, balls dropping or being thrown, and even water, where there was no bearer or guide. In 1900, he moved into the area of aerodynamics. He constructed a wind tunnel in which he photographed smoke fillets traveling around different shaped planes. The appearance of paper film strips on the market in 1888 yielded the final methodological development of Mare's studies of movement. He substituted a roll of paper film for his glass plate, and he constructed a film feeding mechanism that stopped the film for an instant behind the lens. Enough time for an image to be made, and then pulled it onto a roller. These are his earliest films. And one of his most famous, a cat falling, being dropped actually to prove that it always lands on its feet. So it was this camera that Edison bored for his kinetoscope, which you see here, and the addition of a better film feeding mechanism allowed the Lumiere brothers to patent their cinematograph and project the first pictures to a paying public in 1895. Mare also changed the, wat, the, the way the body was represented in the aesthetic domain. Uh, in, in 1904, uh, the experience, sorry, after 1904, the year that he died, the experience of the newly industrialized workplace and the new technologies such as telegraph and telephone and automobile, phonograph and cinema, had come to foster a heightened awareness of subjective time, a sense that for the individual, time proceeds at an irregular pace beyond the reckoning of any standard and authoritative system of measurement. It's part of this new culture of time, the subjective experience, the core of which we call now, that Mare's imagery was severed from its purely scientific roots and comes to belong to the canon of 20th century art. For artists who followed the cubist transformation of spatial and temporal conventions after cubism, Mare's chronophotographs were irresistible. For Franz Kufka, whose women picking of flowers you see here, they resolved his attempts to demonstrate the appearance of motion. For Duchamp, the chronophotographs were seized on as a mechanized alternative to sensible beauty, enabling him to put, as he said, painting at the service of mind. The Italian futurist, this is Boccioni's elasticity of, uh, not, of 1912, sorry, yes, adopted Mare's chronophotography because both scientifically accurate and lyric, lyrically graceful as a ready-made coherent system of signs to express the kinetic and emotional dimensions of the subject. Luigi Russolo here, Bala's dog on a leash here, and to materialize the forces of the invisible and to give visible form to speed and dynamism. Mare is on the top and Bala, 1913, on the bottom. So I want to conclude now by pointing to the link that joins all of these aspects of Mare's work and Mare's work uh, to Bernie. So Mare's work, his subject, and his, which was movement, and his method of mechanical decomposition is at once the beginning of a new synthesis of science and art and the focal point of labor and art and the dissolution of the space-time continuum. It signals the convergence of the new concept of the working body with the crisis of time and space perception. His work, I think, marks the place where social 
and cultural modernity intersect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I thought maybe. Uh, you since, want to switch back? Well, yeah, I'll switch back. Maybe uh, we put it on play. So I was, uh, Marta was uh, ending here on futurism, and there's this other interesting connection. Uh, oops, there was that interesting, that was interesting too. Check this out, the little analog. Oh, I can't get it, it's too fast for me now. Well, anyway, the fair moment, I did you see that break up because of the analog switch, you know, trying to work the digital uh, information? Anyway, um, uh, you know, the, the <clears throat> I actually started making sculpture because of the futurists, so, uh, although I had no idea that the futurists were in any way connected to Mar Marais' work. So, um, you know, this is a Boccioni piece, uh, the development of a bottle in space. Uh, and uh, in uh, 1970, when I was a grad student in uh, psychology, I was, uh, I was, I was, I was, uh, I was started playing with some clay. And uh, anyway, maybe I, I'll get to that in a second. But, uh, but you know, um, this is a, a bronze model of um, of the of one of Mare's. Uh, studies of the birds in motion and you can uh, you can see the different phases of the motion of the bird as it's flying and and uh, and a very marais like sculpture by Baccioni uh, the 1913 unique forms of continuity in space and this was the piece that got me to want to make sculpture while I'm studying psychology in grad school uh, you know um, Wow. Anyway, I'm looking at this, uh, reading my text here, and thinking, what the hell was I thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what I was thinking about. I'm looking at this, I was going to read it, but I don't know what I'm talking about here. Well, because you're talking about modernity. You're I was talking, talking about, about where, where I started, yeah. and That's the true. promise yeah, of you. progress, yeah. scientific yeah. progress, artistic progress, and you're wondering. How <laughs> very embarrassing. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> I'm reading your notes. Yeah, okay. that's good. Well, at least you understood what I was talking about. Absolutely, um, modernity. <laughs> modernity. Yeah. So you know. So you know. In okay. a way, in a way, there is this this falseness and exploitation about about um, you know about uh, about about science and modernity and technological change. You know, it promises this kind of scientific salvation. And, um, and, and, it, and it seemed to me also to be the, the best hope for a solution to any problem. And, uh, and yet, you know, at the same time, it was not that which was inspiring me about this work, even though this work is, um, is referring to that. Um, you, know, I, uh, you know, after seeing this, I, I made this. You know, th I'm gonna show you some, of the, this is the first sculpture I ever, well, the second sculpture. I made one when I was about 10 years old. But uh, this is the, the second sculpture I ever made. You can see this is like, there's no question this is, <laughs> you know, that I'm looking at Baccioni's work and I'm thinking, you know, I can do this, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, but it wasn't just that I could do it, it was just that I wanted to do it, you know. And, and, and the interesting thing was that I, um, I thought of myself at the time, this is pre-Spock from Star Trek, but I thought of myself at, at the time as being this person, I'm about 20, 20 years old, 21 years old, I'm thinking, well, I don't, you know, I don't need emotions. I've evolved beyond emotions. I, you know, I'm a rational being. I, I, it's all reason, you know, just like this scientific idea, you know, uh, that we were talking about here, this idea of, of understanding everything through science. But you know, so emotions just get in the way, and they're nasty and messy, and they and they're clearly, you know, I clearly don't have them. And then I make make something like this, and I and I and I had this revelation. I said, Oh my God, I, I do have emotions, because this 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 thing is out there grasping at something, you know. And um, you know, I I'm thinking, you know, I I don't do that, do I? You know, I don't, you know. <laughs> And, uh, but, I, but I had to recognize that not only did I have the emotions, but um, here's another view of it, but um, not only do I have these emotions, but I also, um, I also probably have been studying psychology to understand myself, and I, it was not working, clearly, because all the psychology was doing was getting me to think of the world as being something I could understand through some theoretical construct. But in fact, there was something else, 
there that I was missing. And, and Baccioni had kind of opened this, this possibility up to me. So I began making these, uh, making these, you know, these, um, these art pieces. Uh, you know, um, I thought you were getting a picture of my hat. <laughs> Which is good, you know. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, anyway, so I just told this story that I now have up on the screen. But, uh, but um, anyway, you know, it was uh, it was a revelation, and and, and there are, the connections kind of abound with Marais. This is one of Mar a series of Marais wind tunnel experiments, uh, and and. And, and one of my early pieces, not quite as early as the ones you just saw, was also uh, this piece, which I called the aerodynamics of sleep. You know? <laughs> and uh, you know, so even in something like this, I'm kind of metaphorizing the same kind of approach, you know, taking this scientific universe and trying to find a way to make it work for me to understand things, in, in, but, but to understand things in, an, in a somewhat different way. Um, than the scientific understanding. And this uh, is not really totally relevant, but this was my first maybe inter mildly interactive piece. This is uh, 1970, 1970. That last one was 73. And this is a little baby, a little baby you could cradle in your arms, you know, and hold, you know. And that was my intention, was that you should pick this up and, and carry it on your arm, you know. And it's a very smooth, fiberglassy kind of thing, done in the year of my daughter's birth, you know. So it was, um, you know, it, it had these, uh, these other connections. Um, anyway, I think that was, that was my little digression <laughs> that was based on following up on the futurists and how they had uh, kind of helped to uh, get me into art. And I had no idea that, that Marais, I, I, didn't, I had never heard of Marais at that point, you know. It was, uh, of course, uh, I, I'd seen Ma Marais uh, in, in uh, there's, a, there's a fabulous book, uh, Simon Gideon, I think. Uh, what is the name of the book? Uh, Mechanization, Mechanization Takes Command. Mechanization Takes Command, yes. And uh, it's a fabulous book, really interesting, where in, part, in one part he connects uh, uh, Marais' automatic camera to the machine gun. <laughs> you know, because they were both roughly at the inventions of roughly the same period, you know. And uh, it's a book like that. It may, he makes those kind of connections uh, all through a huge volume. It's out of print, but I heartily recommend it. And, uh, um, but I'd seen, I'd seen uh, Mare's work in that, but I had kind of forgotten about it. And then I had my little, my little uh, visit to the Back End Museum in Minneapolis and heart trouble and Marta's book. And, and that was it. here we are. And here we are. <laughs> Just, just before we dive, yeah, 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 dive please, yeah. too deep, um, I'm trying to kind of sense the atmosphere in, in the room mm. and see. And if what are you feeling? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I tell you after the announcement. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to sense um, if you have any kind of comments or questions to jump in. Um, you can do this at any time. Um, yeah. I'm just sort of, you know, checking around. I every think now that would be a good idea to hear. Checking around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Please, so that's yeah. the first one already. But can you hold on for one second? Oh, you have you to wait till. Yeah. I give you mine, but you have a second one. Yeah. yeah. There's a. Um, so, it sort of loops from science to art, right? So you, there's a, We we start with the machines of Marais taking pulse and, and making images out of movement, so they become like diagrams, and then diagrams start to inform art and futurism and inform your early sculptures. And then you move back almost. Yes, like you, yeah. you move from, the, f from the, f the, the form of time or the, to the back to the machines. And, and I would like to hear what <coughs> what the perception of both is. So if you see like these forms, right, that relate to time, how that relates to like how you participate in the, in the pieces as, as machines. Is, is there a switch from one art form to another? Yeah, uh, well, I, whatever images I have of the switch are not here. <laughs> but, um, but, but there, uh, it, it wasn't a simple, smooth thing, uh, I don't think, although there are a few pieces on the wall here from 1980, early 1980s that were, um, you know, that were little wall machines that people could play with, little games that people can play with. I think um, 
uh, part of it was that I, I was having these experiences where I'd make something, and, and in the course of making something, I, I would have this almost religious moment where suddenly, suddenly I would understand the universe, this much of it, you know, just this tiniest little bit for just a millisecond. But I, but I was getting this experience that was in kind of an amazing experience, and I, and I started to think gradually that I wanted to somehow get a flavor of that moment into the artwork in a way that wasn't just there in the piece for you to behold, but was there for you to, to have for yourself. That you could somehow get that moment, perhaps, a moment of discovery, a moment of revelation, of, you know, just in a tiny way. So the moment when you see that, that baby hanging on the wall, and you want to pick it up, and you call it interactive, which is really stunning. You call it interactive. <laughs> Is that the same that makes us pick up the handles and, and, and explore? Is that a sort of similar? I think, I think it's, it's the continuation of that, of, that, of that very gesture. Yeah, yeah, so bring the baby back up <laughs> because she's so close. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's a continuation of that same gesture, except that, except that uh, I realized that I, 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 at that point, I had the baby on a baby blanket. <laughs> But that was the closest I had come to to creating a a, a way to suggest that you should pick her up, and uh, and and I think at this point now I have these I, I have these points that are pretty clearly say you know you know crank yourself into me you know for the coffin back here you know or um, you know or wind me up for this clock or or turn turn my handle you know it uh, I may not have a label telling you to do this but the red handle I think speaks volumes uh, and um, you know so um, Isn't yeah it also a question of how Bernie's the machines around us invite us to interact or participate and doesn't that have something to do with their fragility well, yeah here it's, it's sort of the abstract form that yeah it's like a tracing of movements or, or touchings, and that's a clear sign. Touch me. Yeah. So though it seems like extremely determined, like like on a motorcycle, you. Do, but of course, it it's not. It's still explorative, and it's still you still need to stroke it and use it, and something else happens which you can't, re which is not really predictable. In a, in a yeah. Well, because they're they're not accustomed experiences, yeah. I think. You know. So I'm taking a common interface riding a bicycle. I don't know how common cranking yourself into a coffin is, but <laughs> but but, uh, but you know, turning a handle, riding a bicycle, sitting on a stool, these are all things that you would do, but then I'm giving you a different experience with that than you would normally have. Uh, and and I think, yes, I think the, uh, and, and the fragility is part of it because there's an object, a very fragile object here that you're, that you're looking at and you're being invited to touch it and yet and yet, you're not sure, unless you've been drinking a lot, you're not sure whether how, how hard you should touch it, you know. And uh, if you're drinking a lot, then you don't care how hard you should touch it. But um, but you know, if you're but if you're interacting with it and you're sober, you think, well, you know. And, and I like this because it, it makes the objects, even though they're very mechanical things, it, it makes them almost organic, you know, because they have this. They're sort of hovering at this moment between um, between breaking and not breaking, and so as you're working it, you're trying to keep it going. You're trying to keep it alive. I think. I mean, I hope that people have this experience, and and so there. So you're trying to help make something happen, and your investment increases, and you're also you're also you know you're also feeling like there's an interaction going on between you and the machine that you're somehow keeping it alive, making it come alive, keeping it alive, and. Uh, and of course, this is this is something I, I I work towards now. At the beginning, it was because I didn't know what I was doing, and the pieces were always fragile because I didn't know how to make them better. <laughs> now I try to make them fragile, and sometimes it's it's hard. Although we just had another piece break overnight, so you know, it's um, you know it's uh, I'm still working on this line here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was wondering, I didn't see everything yet, but some of the machines, uh, like the input is kind of the same of the output, like when you sit in the in the chair and you wiggle the output with the cheeks, it's like a bit feels for me uh, like the input versus the output is the same, but then 
the other one there where you have to move a lot, bicycle a lot, and then there's a small knitting at the end. Yeah, yeah. Where you, where you, like it feels like this big machine with a lot of input gives this small output. <laughs> but I was wondering if you were playing with these different kinds of... Um, um, yes, yeah. yes, but not quite as consciously as uh, <laughs> as that. But yes, no, I, definitely. And you know, I mean, of course, for me, the slowing down of everything was part of an idea that, that I had that would that no single person, no single group, because that takes more than one person to work. Someone has to be sitting on the couch doing nothing for the pedaling on the bikes to to amount to any knitting. And uh, so I wanted to have. Uh, to have to slow that down so that even though it took more than one person even at one instant, it also took many groups of people over a long period of time for there to be any appreciable knitting starting to occur. But it also does also separate you in a way from, from the, the product. And this one is a very direct connection as you were saying. Um, and uh, this one, I mean, as soon as I made, I, you saw that stool in the earlier video being used to just measure how people are leaning, and then I wanted to make some other kind of interface, some way to have people interact. And I thought, oh, a headset. I haven't done anything with a headset. And um, you know, so I I made a set of latex earphones, and then they. But but because I, for me, everything is everything is everything needs to have errors in it. There have to be mistakes, or I, or I never get anywhere. Um, so I made these latex earphones, but but I made the headset too big, so they fell down onto my cheeks. And, and at that instant, I, I, I heard, you know, the Irving Berlin song, you know, Fred Astaire singing, when we're out together dancing cheek to cheek, you know. And, I, and, and, I, and immediately, I, I coped them up to the, uh, to the stool where these are cheeks in English also. And uh, so the lower cheeks would pump air against your upper cheeks. <laughs> and you can dance with yourself cheek to cheek. So all, all of that was... All of that was clear instantly as soon as as soon as these things fell onto my cheeks by accident, and you know, and then you know the title, the connection to the stool, you know, everything became clear. So, so even though you know, and afterwards I can think about things the way you were describing them, <laughs> but when I'm making them, it's more like this. It's more, it's more like I, um, you know, like I'm just frustrated. I'm doing something, and then something accident happens, and the accident is good. Sometimes the accidents are bad. And um, you know this break that we have right now, that's not a good one. We tested it to see if it would be a good one, but it actually is deadening the sound, and you know we're going to have to fix it. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah. Well, maybe we can kind of save the more practical questions to oh, yeah. to our little tour in the end. Yeah. Yeah. To, please. Yeah. And, um, um, more get into get get our theory straight for the moment, yeah. uh, and then we do the practical <laughs> tour and break it up later on, and then uh, you're most welcome to, um, you know, to, to to go along the tour and come up with with other questions in that regard. Um, so I'm just what I was initially going to say, just trying to send some questions that come into your conversation, um, and um, so if you have any, you just sort of do something like this. And yeah. uh, but <laughs> he's got one. <laughs> yeah. But you haven't even started yet, and you have already questions. Uh, um, well, but no, we, we we take these. Um, I want I wanted to ask if you would talk a bit about the coffin piece and how it came to be. Um, okay, was, was that going to fit with one of your questions? Absolutely. Um, uh, well, uh, first let me find. I have some images of this. I have to find. Uh, so. You, you have a nice gray screen up there, and I will look for this. Uh, uh, and hopefully, it won't take too long. Or the, um, or the MRI piece, whichever. No, no, we, we, we're only, I can only start on one thing at a time. Actually, this image I'm about to bring up is related because it was, um, it was a part of a revelation that came on the same trip um, I took. This is some of the waxworks from. Um, either Bologna or Florence, uh, some of these wax uh, models of the body that were uh, 18th century uh, models uh, that are quite both gruesome and fascinating. And this one is especially disturbing, I find, because it's so sexy. 
and yet it is so horrible. <laughs> um, anyway, that's a digression. I just came across them. Let me go back. <laughs> Sorry, you should never ask me a question. <laughs> ask me no questions. Um, it's obviously way down in here, because I didn't think we were going to get to this at all. But um, uh, um, and oh, and I've also managed to um, I managed to separate some of the images to make it really difficult. Uh, so let's uh, some of them are way up here. Where? Uh, this is fun, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm going to plunge right into the middle of it because I can't find the beginning. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is the problem of having a 12-inch uh, laptop. You know, you, uh, you, um, you know, the little thumbnails on the side are so small that I can't see anything. Um, but, uh, but. The, the coffin piece is a piece, I started this piece, and in a way you can maybe, my first slide I was going to show you is about the horns and the springs. So you could uh, look at the slide as it were right here. And um, the horns and the springs, it's, it's, it's um, you know, I was thinking of a model of the brain. And I, trying to, I thought I could make a tin can telephone model of the brain. These are really tin can telephones. You know, we, we have uh, paper cups or tin cans with a string between them. And you're, you're saying, I can't hear you. That's what you mostly say. Um, you know, um, pull the string tighter. You know, and you're, you know, you're kind of doing this. So this is my kind of model of the brain. You know, I think it kind of has this synaptic look to it. And, um, and uh, and, but at the time I was working on this, my mother's health was failing. I'm talking to her on the telephone. I'm thinking about how fabulous the telephone is. You know, my mother could be dead. I could be speaking to her on the telephone. I wouldn't really know because the telephone is kind of magic. You know, I don't actually see, feel the person I'm speaking to. I just assume that because she's saying something, she can't be dead. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe she could be, and, and so I'm doing. I'm doing this, and at the same, and uh, and then I went, I went to my mother when she was actually dying, and uh, and was with her when she died, and uh, and then uh, I had to take a break. I thought I had to do something about death in, involved with the brain somehow in terms of this piece, but I didn't know what it was going to be. And I went uh, on a uh, Marty and I went on a trip to Europe, and um, and uh, Isabella, who's sitting next to. So Marty uh, took us to one of her favorite churches in Bologna, Santo Stefano, and uh, and, and I, I can say more about the the church. But it's I've got a few images of the interior, and it's a very claustrophobic little church, and um, you have to go on this little journey into the church until you finally get to this spot where you can see where the the bones of the saint are. But you can't get to where the saint is because the saint you've been blocked from this. And, and I had this, this revelation that, you know, to me, other people have undoubtedly thought of this before, but I thought, ah, oh, this is installation art. You know, you've come a certain distance, you've come to this place, you've made a journey, you're there, you're a pilgrimage, if you will, but you're there, um, you know, at, at this spot. You, can't, you can only experience this, this particular piece of art if you're there. You can look at pictures of it, but it's not going to do the same thing. You have to be there. And um, in the same way, you have to be at an installation piece. And, and, and yet here we come all this distance. We come you know, right next to where the saint is, but we can't get to the saint. And, there's a, and, and just like in installation art, there's a message. There's some information that's being imparted here. You know, the designers of the church have, are telling us that we can't get to the saint because the saint is living in a different universe than the one we're in. The saint is not only a saint and you're not. <laughs> I'm a saint, and you're not. Um, but but also, uh, but also, uh, but also, the, the saint is dead, and you're not. You know, and and no matter how much distance you traverse, you can't traverse that distance of death and still be alive. You know, so that very idea made me want to make a coffin that would allow you to crank yourself into it and come back out. 
but also be able to speak to people over tin can telephones on the outside, you know. So, um, you know, and also, and still not be able to understand a word anyone is saying. So it, it seemed altogether perfect, you know, to me. Uh, so anyway, so this is how um, the, uh, the, the coffin piece uh, connects. What, what is the coffin piece's name? Oh, uh, oh yes, the name, yeah. Well, the name, <laughs> names for me come from myriad sources. So like cheek to cheek, as you heard, came from the, the uh, the you know the Irving Berlin song. But you have some very interesting names. The yeah. belief would be a brother, which is over yeah. there, and the uh, theory of entanglement and the etiology of innocence. So, how do you come to these names? Well, I give you first the coffin piece, which is you know it's dot dot dot, you know so the uh, lip. Uh, what did they call that? Ellipsis. Ellipsis, Ellipsis and then uh, um, you know. Uh, and the synapse sweetly singing. So I'm making a reference to the brain with the synapse, but the, the actual line is kind of a bastardization of an old Cream song. The Cream being a rock and roll group from the late 60s, uh, early 70s, and uh, they had a song, The Tales of Brave Ulysses, how his naked ears were tortured by the sirens sweetly singing. And, um, and, uh, and of course they had like Ginger Baker slamming on the drums at that moment, so it's, I can't do that for you here. So, uh, but um, so I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the. Uh, I was. I was trying to make an allusion to the brain and and this end to death because I think you know there. Um, it's kind of a Freudian thing almost that you know that that um, you know that 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 creativity and thinking and death are all kind of interconnected in our minds uh, uh, because our minds are kind of trying to work out the fact that we're going to die somehow even though it's not consciously there. I don't know if I believe this or not, but it's an interesting idea. And, um, and it's also kind of like that thing, you know, with about the saints, about this kind of elusive quality. And I think the sirens, you know, the sirens for Ulysses, we're also a figment of his mind. I mean, it's really, I think, you know, I think it's kind of this thing, you know, this sort of self-absorption, you know, of, of ourselves within our minds, you know, that we get this sense of, uh, of um, you know, of, of, uh, of that there's this song out there, you know, that we that are drawn to irresistibly. And it's really just us. <laughs> it's our brains working, you know. And I think Isabella took me on a tour of her lab and we were listening to, uh, we were listening to the synapses clicking away, you know, through some mechanical, uh, some electrical transposition, you know, and it was um, another, um, another one of these things. I'm thinking, oh, so this is what I sound like when I'm off. <laughs> You know, so, uh, which apparently doesn't happen too often, but um, um, yeah. So other, other, other pieces, uh, other title. Well, belief would be a brother. Is um, I want this piece is really very much a copy of a Murray apparatus, uh, which um, which uh, Marta showed you in, in that connection. I probably have a picture here somewhere, but if I look for it, I won't be able to talk. Um, and and it's. Um, it, you know, it's an apparatus. So he's trying to simulate the flight of a bird or an insect, and uh, try to trying to see if he could actually make it make something that would move, with simply by putting two feathers on this pneumatic pumping machine. You know, so I've got a pneumatic pumping machine without the feathers, but it does um, it does. Uh, Fly. It does sort of fly. It kind of bounces and attempts to get off the ground. So this is truly was done as an homage, homage to Marais, and um, I, uh, I so I wanted somehow the title to honor him in some way. And I'm thinking, okay, so he, you know, Marais, Marais is a hero of mine in a sense, and and at that moment I'm thinking of this Wallace Stevens poem. I'm thinking of uh, of uh, the man with the blue guitar, where he. It's a very long poem. I don't think one of his best, although one of his most famous. And it does have some fabulous lines in it, like um, uh, paint us a picture beyond our beyond us yet ourselves, something exactly as we are. And uh, um, uh, I'm I'm not doing that well, am I? But anyway, but it's something like that. But at one point, he's also talking about um, air. <laughs> I mean, the associations in one's mind, are, if you track them down, it's really nuts. Anyway, I'm thinking air somehow is crossing my mind in the course of all this. And, 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 and Stevens is talking about air. He has this little, little interlude where he says, good air, good friend. Uh, um, you know, uh, and then he says, uh, yeah, belief would be a brother, belief would be a friend. 
And I'm thinking, well, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking, well, I'd like to have this sense of connection to Marais, you know, <laughs> this sense of, um, of, of, of friendship through the air, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, you would never know that <laughs> reading the title. There would be no way you could possibly come up with that. But nevertheless, it seemed to feel right. <laughs> And the etiology of innocence. Ah, well, this is uh, this is also very connected to Mare because it, it's um, because when I look at uh, let me find find this image again because this is worth uh, going back to uh, <clears throat> when I find Mare. Uh, this is up at the beginning, which is good because I don't have to go all the way to the end to find this. Um, but not that beginning. <laughs> Not that his, beginning. His, well, I, had, uh, I have one image I don't know that you have here. Ah, well, here, actually, just as a little another aside, this is an image of, uh, and then we'll get back to the question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh, I hit play this way. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a book about the brain. This is an image from a book about the brain uh, by uh, Gerald Edelman, and he makes this analogy that the brain is like a network of springs. And I came across this, I am happy to say, after I had my network of springs already made up, I'm thinking, ah, yes. You know, I have no idea exactly what he's talking about in this. <laughs> except, that, except that you, with springs, you get a kind of a resonant memory, you know, which is different than, um, you know, it's a very analog kind of thing, you know, and to simulate the way a spring works digitally, you can't really do that. And I think that Edelman is partially arguing for this kind of meaty, meaty quality to the brain, um, although I'm not sure because I didn't really understand his book. <laughs> um, anyway, back to my search here for uh, the image I was looking for. Uh, here, here it is. Um, um, right nearby, as it turns out. So, so this image of Marais, really, which is the beginning of, the, of this heart piece, it really sums up um, I, I think this this interesting connection because on the right side you have all this industrial apparatus, you know this this somewhat sophisticated you know mechanism to activate this thing, and on the left side on the board strapped to the board you've got these these uncertain organs. You know, I mean, what is the significant part of this? Mare wasn't sure what was what was significant about heart action. Was the shape of the aorta particularly important? Was the the shape of the ventricle and the auricle were these things important? So he's kind of trying to maintain organic shapes here, <laughs> and there's a certain innocence in this in that gesture. You know, um, and so the title of the piece, um, you know. Uh, the word ideology is a word, it's an English word for, that really is in the medical profession. It's about the origins of a disease. Um, you know, when we talked about the title of the show, I had suggested ideology of innocence, and everyone at V2 said, ideology means nothing in Holland. <laughs> no one will understand what you're talking about. Um, so we should do something else. I said, okay, origins. Um, but, but ideology has so much more in it, because the, because the ideology, um, because uh, first of all, I'm suggesting that innocence f is frequently thought of as a disease, you know, by 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 uh, by by posing it this way, by saying ideology of innocence, and I'm also I'm also alluding to my own medical history, you know, that I guess when I hit my chest it makes noises, right? Yeah, not a good idea. Um, <laughs> my heart, you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we can work it. Um, so. Uh, the uh, you know so I'm alluding to um, you know my own medical history with this with the word ideology as well, and um, and I'm also thinking about this kind of this moment in time when Marais was working, where 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 it was really kind of you know he started with this almost innocent gesture to try and understand these things mechanically, and th and in a way from looking at images like this you th you think that he starts thinking that it, the that the that the images that the explanation is going to be simple. It's going to be clear. It's not going to be that difficult. And then you see that the apparatus at the back is already getting to be much more complicated than he probably originally intended. You can see these things look like they've evolved. They've become more complex. And you know, so I think that there's this interesting connection between the way the world works. In fact, um, I think, uh, do I have it above? No, I have it below. Um, uh, this is the piece. This is a later Mare uh, circulatory model. And you can see this image 
has nothing organic looking in it. There's nothing simple. This is a sophisticated model of the circulatory system. You know, Marais has already discovered that these, this, this, this quick idea that he had that the shape of things was going to be critical was not so critical. The volumes were critical. The, um, the timing was critical. So he's got an, another apparatus here now that it looks totally mechanized that's also being a heart. You know, in because, the same. But Mari believed that the body was a machine. I don't think you do. Well, I don't think that. Uh, that I, I think I believe the body is a machine, but I think it's a broken machine. And a fragile one. <laughs> yeah, I think. I think machines. I think because this idea that the body is a machine is, um, you know, people think of when oh, if you think of the body as a machine, you think it's an ideal machine, but. But in the world, there are no ideal machines. I think he was just, he, he could be all reduced to mechanics. Well, that, I mean, I'm, I'm alive because of some of that reductionism. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they replaced a piece of plumbing, you know, and, uh, you know, and saved, the and saved my life, you know, because the, the plumbing was, about, the pipe was about to burst. They mm -hmm. put a piece of Dacron hose in there instead, and, uh, you know, you know, it's now, uh, how many years later? 14 years later. And it's still working. Knock on wood. This is why I work in wood, by the way. I get to knock on wood, which is an English expression for having, keeping good luck. <laughs> knock on wood. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Also, that there is emotion. There is more than a machine and everything. So you find out emotion in your, uh, in your job. So where is the emotion in uh, this case? Well, I think I, I'm hoping. Well, first of all, this is the I, I think you know as we were talking before the fragility, I think of these machine of my machines are fragile enough that I think that your your heart goes out to them, so you start to get an emotional attachment to them, even though they're machines, and then you're playing with them, so you're starting to feel things. You're starting to feel yourself feeling a, a connection to this machine. You're starting to be wonder at, at what it's doing and, and listen to the noises and they're evoking associations and emotions are starting to come up. I'm hoping, and um, and you know, uh, so I, I'm thinking that you that you know, I'm you know, in a way, I'm trying to create this uh, this machine acts as a device to provoke something in you, but not necessarily to tell you what you're going to feel. Um, although, you know, there are some, you know, I'm obviously contriving as much as I can here. And uh, so I'm hoping that you'll feel emotions and, the, and that you'll be the conduit and that the, you know, of, of, of the emotional part of the piece. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so even this, uh, even the piece, the theory of entanglement downstairs where, um, you know, you're, you know, people are gradually making this knitting happen. It's all very mechanized. And yet, when I was making the piece, and uh, and I, I wanted there to be this part where someone was doing nothing, and that was important for someone sitting on the couch doing nothing, that that would be important for the piece to work. And this friend of mine came over and said, um, what you have here is a metaphor for capitalism. Is <laughs> There's someone doing nothing, and that's what makes everything happen. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so I hadn't thought about that, but I, I added a label that says that when you're doing nothing, you're, you're engaged in, uh, you're, you're, you are the capital. And then the labor also has a label, and the craft has a label. And, um, and what's, happen what's been happening, especially here at V2, for some reason, um, people are, are, um, are starting to play the roles of the, uh, of the capitalists and the labor. You know, they're starting to argue about you know, union rules. Why should, I, why should I keep working like this? We're just sitting there. No, keep working. You must keep working. You know, <laughs> I need to see what you're doing. You know, and you know, and 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 so there's this other little you know connection to you know to aspects of daily life that I had never been part of the original piece, but but crept into it, and yet and now they have this emotional impact, even though. That piece is, is actually a colder piece in many ways than, than, than many of the others. Um, although it's about knitting, which is a very, you know, kind of home, home body kind of event. Anyway, I don't know. I, I, the emotions creep in through my associations, I guess. Yeah. Which is the way to intuition. Oh, intuition, yeah, yeah. You have to use the mic because I can't hear yeah, you. sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's an intuitive kind of thing, I guess, but I, I kind of trust that if I'm making a machine, it'll, it'll come out differently because, um, because I'm making it. <laughs> 
and that and that somehow something else that's going on inside me is going to infect it. And um, and uh, and I guess you know, knock on wood again. I I, I feel like I've been lucky so far, you know. <laughs> It also suggests intimacy, theory of entanglement, yeah, conservation, conservation of intimacy. intimacy yeah. So you have the intimacies of the body and the machine and the bodies with other bodies. That seems to be a strong... Yeah, and I'm very interested in this, in, in having people have to connect in some way to, to work the pieces. Uh, Not just to the machines, but to each other. To each other, exactly. That they, uh, I mean, in this piece, it's a, in, a rel in the ideology of innocence, it's relatively crude, you know, the connection that is. You know, one person is cranking this, and they can't see what they're doing. I mean, they can see the organs working, but they can't see anything else that they're having an effect on. You know, the heartbeat on the other side of the wall, the organs throbbing over there, um, and and uh, and and yet, you know. So what people do is that they hopefully will find another person to help them, <laughs> and they'll say, "Okay, I'll crank this. I know there's something going on over there. I'll crank this for you, but you know, maybe you can crank it for me. You know, I'll do it for you if you do it for me." So it's. Um, you know, it's uh, you know, there's a certain little elemental re reciprocity starts to build up, and people st f start to form conversations and and uh, interact about it. And oh, well, look, this is connected here too. Okay, let me do that again. And then maybe a larger group starts to form. I'm hoping, and you know, and then with the you know the synapse piece, I'm hoping for these conversations to be happening inside and outside the coffins, and and then downstairs, I'm really applying my technology to studying a couple sitting together on the bench and if the way they move is um, uh, is actually being written on the wall and indicated by these balls moving and uh, if they uh, if they're working with each other it, it well if it's if it's one person it, you can make things work but if with two people things work better and uh, and with uh, two people who are working with each other they work better yet <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I guess we can take maybe one or two more questions before we further yeah. informalize our gathering. Yeah. So let me just check. Uh, there were you, some Marla. before. I think, yeah. Um, maybe I have one too. Um, and yeah. that is, um, you've been elaborating on your you know, connect, connections, um, connectedness to, to Murray and his work. And um, you know, I sometimes think, of course, it's totally fictitious what Murray would have. You know, like if you had a conversation or you know, like a meeting in a in your studio, um, it's just you know. Sometimes I wonder, you know, because you say you, you're taking, you know, the you take from the images, from the ideas, from the from the theory, and um, maybe that's also a question uh, to Marta, who has you know been like really. Uh, getting into the work of Marie, and um, you know, like, what would be the cross, you know, fictitious cross connection, uh, Marie going through the exhibition of Bernie today? That's, that's a, a bit of a weird question. That's I know. a very interesting question. Marie was, as I hoped, I showed through the trajectory of changing the subject and the the machine and the subject and the machine and the camera and then the film. And he was always working towards an increased, uh, a finer and finer way of analyzing movement out there, whereas I think that he would find Bernie's machines out of date. <laughs> Backward. <laughs> out of date. Interesting. Dealing with, with things that, that uh, he would have immediately, I think, gone up and tried to fix it, don't you? I, I, I do. Also, I, I actually know, in a sense, what Marais would say, because I had a conversation with a proxy of Marais, in a sense. Uh, the, um, I, I told you I f discovered this work at the, uh, at the back in Institute. And the curator there had kindly taken me around and shown me all this stuff, and I'd gotten so excited that he gave me booklets and, you know, and um, took me into the vault, and I got to see the actual piece of glass that Miller and Yuri had used to create l the amino acids with lightning, and, you know, it was, you know, it was like, and uh, so, so I thought after I had done all this work, I thought I would send. Um, uh, the video back to um, you know Albert, and uh, he would uh, he would be interested to see what I had done with you know based on this this work, and 
And he, and he said, well, you know, I watched your video, but, you know, I prefer the real thing. Oh. <laughs> There's, but there's really no comparison. I mean, Mari becomes more detached, and the whole beauty of Bernie's work is the involvement and the intimacy that you have, as we talked about, with the machine. Mari is moving away from the, from. I mean, think of the camera. You know, he doesn't even need his yeah. tubing anymore. He's got light. Yeah. Touch becomes irrelevant. Touch I mean, becomes yeah. totally irrelevant to him, and it's everything to Bernie. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, not much. That's what he would say. I think so. Okay, yeah. well, that's good to know. Um, I'm so channeling him. Over here. I have a question, and I hope I can explain myself well. I uh, happened to see this uh, Hollywood movie yesterday, and it was about a guy who teaches uh, physics and math, and he basically believes that the world is rational and everything can be calculated, but then his, his wife dies, and he finds a string of numbers that predict the, the future and, and then the movie goes on and he starts doubting like is my belief this solid or is there some order in the world um, and I, I wonder by your accidents in finding names and uh, you're knocking the table your work starts kind of uh, practical but do you have a conclusion about um, yeah, your opinion about reality in this order well, I like to hedge my bets. <laughs> and I, uh, let's see if I can find these. Well, you'll see these things. There are a couple. There's one right behind you. I've got these little uh, boxes in the show that, uh, in, that, that say uh, just in case on them. And inside the boxes, here's one. Um, it says just in case. And th this is an expression in English, right, for just in case something happens. You know, uh, just in case something were to go wrong, you see, I've got uh, I've got an out of order sign. I've got <laughs> I've got four of these in the exhibit, you know, which is a very magical gesture. I mean, it's sort of like um, you know, it's sort of like uh, invoking this 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 uh, invoking gods I don't believe in, and yet you know, sort of reminding them that I'm ready, so maybe they won't bother to um, to make things break. Because they, you know, I mean, because of course everything is about messing with me. <laughs> you know, why would they bother if, um, you know, if uh, they know I'm ready for them? Um, they do anyway. They ignore me completely, and uh, whoever they are. But I still keep the out of order signs there because they have some practical use. And um, and I think that this is, and this also, I've got this little story with this as well because um, Niels Bohr, the one of the founders of quantum uh, mechanics. Um, and quantum mechanics is this terribly mysterious universe, really, that it proposes. It proposes um, really a breakdown in our whole notion of causality um, at a microscopic level. At a larger level, causality still works, but at a microscopic level, you have a theory of entanglement, for one thing, you know, that where particles can be entangled and they can affect each other without having any, any way of doing that. Um, they just are entangled, and therefore they will always respond together in some way. Um, but Niels Bohr apparently had a horseshoe over his, the door to his office. And his colleagues would say, Niels, you're a scientist. You don't believe in this magic stuff, do you? And he said, no, 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 of course I don't believe it. But they say it works whether you believe it or not. <laughs> Good. So this is the way I feel. <laughs> I think that's true. I think that's actually a pretty good way to conclude. <laughs> yeah. And um, it says temporarily out of order. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. we're working on our temporality just yes, now. Our temporal, and we yeah. further I informalize, I suggest, um, the situation. So you can keep on asking questions. Um, but we just sort of move around close yeah, yeah. to the coffee table. There's still coffee and some food uh, over there. Right. And you're welcome to help yourself there. Um, and so we also move around the space. Bernie, Marta are still here and around, and yeah. we just sort of break it up at this stage. Now, thank you very much uh, for your presentations and your talk here, Bernie, and especially Marta. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> so. So I'm, I'm going to uh, actually go to take a informal, very informal bathroom break. And, uh, um, and can.